Okay, so welcome everyone to our webinar on the state of play of the WTO e-commerce negotiations. My name is Nicholas Kühler Suzuki, and I'm a trade policy advisor at International Trade Intelligence in Paris, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Trade Policy Exchange. For those of you who don't know us yet, the Trade Policy Exchange is an, an open forum for trade policy debates, and we promote a diverse range of voices and want to help a global audience to understand important trade policy discussions that are happening in Geneva. This event is the first in a series of webinars on digital trade. If you're interested in this topic, you can already mark your calendars for our next webinar on the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement in the Asia Pacific on the 16th of June. I'm happy to see that we have hundreds of participants from all continents, but Antarctica today. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. Before we start, I would like to thank um, Mata Soprana at TradePol Consulting and Bocconi Uni University in Milan, and Franziska Sucker at the University of uh, Witwatersrand in Johannesburg for helping us to put together such an excellent panel. Our topic today are the e-commerce negotiations at the WTO. The WTO began a multilateral work program on electronic commerce in 1998, when the World Wide Web was still very young. But this work program has not made much progress. The web is turning 30 this year and is no longer adolescent. So it is high time to see if global rules are still fit for purpose. Because of the slow progress in multilateral discussions, 74 WTO members started negotiations for a plurilateral agreement on electronic commerce in 2019, and 12 more members have joined them since. There's a long list of issues under discussion, including electronic transactions, digital trade facilitation, facilitation data flows, data localization, consumer protection, and market access. It was a goal to deliver an outcome before the next ministerial conference of the WTO in November, but the negotiations have been quite difficult in several areas. Now, we are very lucky to be joined today by Susan Aronson, Fabiana Fong, Marianne Kamau, and Kim Campbell to help us make sense of the current state of play. Susan Aronson is research professor at George Washington University and the director of the Digital Trade and Governance Hub. She has written extensively on digital trade issues and recently published a deep dive into the history of the WTO e-commerce negotiations, which I can highly recommend to you. Susan will tell us about the interests of the United States today. Fabiana Fong is a policy consultant at the International Trade Center, where she has worked on emerging trade topics, including digital trade. She was previously a young professional at the WTO and at the Center for WTO Studies um, of the Ministry of Commerce in China. Fabiana will tell us about China's perspective today. Mariana Kamau is an international trade lawyer and associate at Sidley Austin in Brussels. She is specialized in WTO and EU trade law and policy, in particular the regulation of the digital economy. Marianne uh, will tell us about the role of the European Union in the negotiations in her private capacity. And last, but certainly not least, is Kim Campbell who is a trade advisor for emerging trade issues at the Commonwealth Small States Office in Geneva. She was previously an economic counselor at the South African Mission to the UN and has extensive experience in formulating strategies and policy recommendations for developing countries. Kim will tell us about the position of small developing countries in the e-commerce negotiations. Our panelists will start us off with some short presentations and we will then open up the floor to a Q&A with the audience. So without further ado, I hand over to Susan and then we will proceed in alphabetical order. Susan, what is the role of the United States in the WTO e-commerce negotiations? Well, for, first, let me say thank you for organizing this panel and I'm really honored to participate with such wonderful, smart women. So just to summarize where the United States is at, the United States needs a trade success. But Fast Track, which is the authority by which Congress grants the US government to negotiate, uh, is about to expire this year. 
But we need to remember that the United States, on one hand, is less trade dependent than other nations. On the other hand, the United States and China are the most dominant on data and tech, right? Data-driven change. But the United States, in contrast with China, is behind on data governance. We are way behind. Um, so the Biden administration has other priorities. And this is not, trade is not a top priority. Um, and it, uh, one of the weird things about the US government is even though the president is for four years, really the first year is about when he or she can make innovative policies. And so digital trade and trade is not a top priority. So I also wanna highlight the context, which is that Congress is really changing. We're actually starting to have some regulation of tech and of data. And you know, this is just the listing of some of the things that Congress is working on, including revising intermediary liability, rethinking, right? The United States has lots of laws governing personal data, but they're not one unified law. And so that's happening. Thinking about how you regulate social networks and disinformation, possibly regulating behavioral advertising, working with our allies on principles to govern AI and how you do that. And I think the most important is how do you find ways to regulate the data giants without weakening the data giants, right? Because many people believe that you have to have economies of scale and scope in data to come up with the next data-driven services, whether that's some form of AI or uh, VR or whatever, or smart manufacturing. Finally, you know, if I were sitting in the White House, I would not move forward on trade because, you know, that's just not worth alienating other members of your party and the Republicans' protectionism, at least under Trump. So I do think the WTO draft, that if, if it's correct, and I've been told that it is by WTO staffers, it's out of date, but it does meet many of the U.S. concerns. But that said, I think the U.S. and WTO templates are totally out of date. First of all, if we really want to build free flow with trust, we need to focus on those things that are undermining trust online. And that's not uh, performance requirements. Okay. So let's look at the template. The template for both the US and the WTO at this point is number one, free flow of data default with exceptions, a ban on data localization or server localization and performance requirements for privacy, spam, and to protect consumer welfare, right? If you, and, uh, you know, we can talk about this. Telling a nation to enforce their own laws if they don't know how to govern data is idiocy. Um, it's not effective. Um, so, in my mind, why not address the concerns of users? And that is the polls they're concerned about, whether that's malware, disinformation, internet shutdowns, they too can yield trade distortions or undermine market access. I want to give you a couple examples of these barriers and the types of trade effects they can have. I'm not going to go into this. But as examples, data sharing platforms such as the EU is starting to have, this could violate MFN and national treatment, uh, national policies to limit disinformation, privacy labels for apps such as Apple now has. Again, we can talk about all this later. I don't you know, wanna hog the time. Censorship or internet shutdowns. That can totally violate market access. Okay. So you, you see what I'm talking about here. So what would a free flow with trust temp template look like? First of all, it would focus on interoperability, okay, for these regulatory areas. So coming up with a unit trial law and giving countries governance training and the skills to better enforce those laws would be very helpful. The WTO should be exploring if internet shutdowns, censorship are barriers. Um, 
providing incentives and training to developing countries so that they and then there's other things that the WTO could do outside of the negotiations. And I just want to list that. Again, using trade disputes to define barriers to digital trade, creating a study group. So the CAT used to have tons of study groups. But let's figure out what, what are barriers? What are practices that should be banned? You know, all nations can use the exceptions if they have to shut down. But, there, but gen generic shutdowns, such as India has done in the last year, 49 shutdowns, you know, maybe that should be regulated because it does have huge implications for firms that are online. Then using the trade policy reviews to monitor each other's digital trade policies and providing capacity building assistance. Okay, I hope I haven't gone beyond my seven minutes, but thanks for hearing me out. Thank you so much, Susan. That was a very interesting presentation. And maybe in the Q&A, we can go a little bit more into uh, some of the negotiation positions and so on that the US has taken as well. But we'll for now um, continue first with uh, Fabiana. Um, and Fabiana will give us a brief introduction to China's interests and um, positions in the e-commerce negotiations. Thank you, Fabiana. Your, your thank you. Unmute. Yeah, thank you, Nicholas. Um, I hope I've started the screen sharing. Have I? Yeah. Okay. So, um, first of all, thank you also for inviting me to this wonderful panel, and I'd like to. Uh, mentioned that I'm speaking on my personal capacity today as well. So I'm not representing uh, the views of ITC or China, but I would like to share some of my observations of China position at the WTO e-commerce uh, GSI. So first, um, I'll give you a brief uh, picture on what e-commerce means to China. So according to a report of Armitech, China ranked third in total e-commerce sales in 2018. So right after the US and Japan. But um, while China's B2B sales is lower than that of US, Japan and Korea, it has been a leader in B2C e-commerce, which is the retail e-commerce. So it seems to be in line with what we would expect considering the US leads in digital service uh, with giant techs such as Facebook and Google, while China's edge in e-commerce is in goods trade via online marketplace such as Alibaba and its domestic version of Taobao. So, and because of the importance of B2C commerce in China, China has more interest in goods trade facilitation by e-commerce, as well as its related services, such as the logistics and e-payment, and has been reflected in its domestic and international policies towards e-commerce. So indeed, China has been strengthening in its regulatory development in e-commerce over the past few years. So at the national level, China has introduced the e-commerce law in 2019, which aims to enhance the protection of consumers and specifically regulates the conduct of platform operators such as Alibaba, Taobao, Jingdong, and other platform uh, in-platform operators, such as the sellers on platform. And at the regional level, China started to contain a designated or standalone chapter for e-commerce in its FTAs. So the examples we have got is um, China, Australia, FTA, and China, Korean FTA in 2005. And perhaps what is more noteworthy is the recent RCEP which it includes provisions related to data localization and cross-border transfer of information by electronic means. So although these provisions are bound to exception clause, it shows positive sign for China to commit to a border spate of sensitive issues in e-commerce. So of course, China is also um, a participant of, uh, of the WTO e-commerce JSI, which I will expand a little bit more. So China has so far submitted three proposals and uh, to elaborate its position on e-commerce. 
So I have briefly summarized them into four key areas. So first, China proposed member to define legal terms such as trade-related aspects of e-commerce and electronic transmission. And also China requests clarifications on the relationship between future e-commerce rules with existing WTO commitment. So in which the e-commerce JSI uh, quoted should not be construed to have changed or modified members' existing market access commitments. So uh, second is, um, as mentioned earlier, China mainly focuses on cross-border trade in goods enabled by the internet. So um, as uh, mentioned, it has support actually a lot of measures uh, relating to paperless trading, e-signatures and contracts, just to facilitate the traditional aspect of e-commerce trade. Um, in contrast with the US position, maybe US is more focused on the digital side. So also, China proposed provisions on regulations and good governance in e-commerce, uh, but it emphasized um, on policy space. So it, this is uh, actually um, something that we will also touch on for cybersecurity and internet, and internet sovereignty. And last but not the least, China also highlights the importance of development cooperation and support technical assistance and capacity building for developed for developing countries, especially LDCs. So these are the key areas that China is looking at right now. And when it comes to China principle, so I try to summarize it as briefly as I can. So as an emerging economy positioned in the developing camp, China has been upholding its objective in the development dimension. So, uh, to bridge digital divide and seize opportunities for all developing countries. So this can be found in um, China's proposal. And also um, China emphasized the importance of an open and transparent negotiation that could ultimately reach a multilateral outcome and allows flexibility to reserve policy space for domestic regulations. So again, policy space uh, which also leads to sovereignty is um, kind of a principle or red line for China. So I think uh, it is reasonable to say that security and sovereignty are two keywords in summarizing China's principles and red lines in e-commerce negotiations. And in fact, um, China propos proposals have highlighted several times on this and include clauses such as right to regulate, right to conduct content review, which is censorship according to some um, academia, and also right to uh, uh, conduct legitimate public policy objectives. So although, and although um, data flow as mentioned by Susan is considered as one of the most important yet sensitive issues as well, China does actually acknowledge is important. Just that the scope of data flow should be limited to trade related aspects only and must be subject to the precondition of security and orderly in compliance with members respective laws and regulation. So um, what is the landing ground for MC12? Well, um, my, my view is the WTO e-commerce JSI is definitely a very important test case for the multilateral trading system, especially for the post all around era. But it is important to note that um, the incorporation of a prelateral agreement within the WTO framework would require consensus among all WTO members. So member including China might want to secure provisions in areas with less divergence such as the trade facilitation, um, consumer protection, or maybe even moratorium on uh, custom duties in order to reach um, some sort of outcome by November. And also China uh, is also likely to uphold its support for de developing countries and call for a mechanism that enabled um, tiered obligations for different categories of developing members to achieve 
um, different levels of commitments at different speeds. But uh, this, of course, well, would depend on whether or not advanced economy like the US, EU, etc., would agree with such flexibility and might involve the classification of developing countries and the SDNT issues. So I think that the key here is how to balance between high ambition and high participation of the e-commerce JSI and how to keep the momentum of the negotiation. So I hope that my brief introduction can give you a, view, a brief view on um, what China, where China is standing and I look forward to the discussions with you all as well. Thank you very much, Fabiana, especially for contrasting China's position with the United, United States position. Um, next up, we have Marianne's presentation on the European Union, the, the third big uh, elephant in the room. Um, and the EU uh, is often portrayed to have a third way approach that is somewhere between the US um, and China. So Marianne, can you tell us a little bit um, what that approach is and how the EU um, is positioning itself in the plurilateral negotiations? Thank you, Nicholas. First of all, let me uh, express my, my deep appreciation and gratitude uh, to be on this panel and share my two cents on uh, the matter at hand. I'll uh, try to um, share my thoughts on this in sort of three lens. Um, I think it will be sort of following what has been done before, looking at the EU's approach more generally, and then looking at what has been uh, proposed uh, within the context of the ongoing negotiations and then sort of uh, look into the future where, where what we're looking uh, towards uh, um, in the road to MC, uh, MC12. And hopefully in the course of doing that, then we'll sort of see uh, the divergence, the, diverge, the divergent views between the US, China and, and the EU. Um, starting with the EU's uh, current position, uh, most of you will probably know or have noted that um, uh, in, in February, the Commission, the European Commission published a trade policy report, which essentially sets out the EU's approach uh, in matters trade policy. And uh, the report or essentially the policy is centered on the idea of um, open strategic autonomy, an interesting uh, choice of set of words. Uh, but essentially what that is, what that means is that it's centered on the idea of openness, both internally and externally. But uh, on top of that, uh, that you know, the EU would have to safeguard its ability to decide for itself, make, make its own choices and shape um, its own uh, trade policy and, and trade rules. And ensuring that those rules reflect its strategic interests and values. Um, this is uh, significant because um, one of the key elements, one of the key areas that the Commission notes is important for the EU to achieve its objectives in the medium term is supporting digital transition and um, promoting trade in, in, in services. So it seems that there's an understanding from the EU side that you know, trade policy is significant or is relevant to um, achieving uh, objectives that are linked to digital digital uh, transition, digital transformation, and also uh, growth of businesses in, in general. And I think that informs the support uh, and, and the fact that the EU is the greatest proponent of um, harmonizing or at least updating the, group, the global rule book on, on digital trade rules. Uh, but noting that as well, there's also one element um, that's, that's significant. And I guess that's, that departs from the US approach uh, and, the, and the Chinese approach is that the EU has what you would call a value-based approach to digitalization. I think this stems from the understanding that, you know, much as data is the lifeblood of uh, the economy, of the digital economy, and that digital technologies can uh, create uh, economic, um, economic gain or e welfare gains, uh, rather, much as it may do that, then it also poses um, significant risks or there's a huge impact on security and, and values um, that the EU sort of upholds. And I think that's, the, that's a way to, to sort of look, look at how you know, the EU's approach into uh, some of the contentious issues um, amongst the three key uh, partners, um, partners is. 
So with that sort of general um, idea, then you might understand why on issues such as you know, data, the EU would be uh, cautious. I mean, recognizing that this is, this is important, but there needs to be an approach that you know, safeguards um, certain values and, and uh, certain interests. Um, and again, then you will also see that the EU will support uh, proposals to remove barriers to um, uh, flows on, on, uh, on, on data, because there's an understanding that even their own businesses will benefit from um, uh, removal of, of such barriers. But then in doing so, um, you know, there needs to be some sort of compliance with uh, EU data protection rules and, and the privacy um, regulations and that there's a need to sort of first sort of balance you know the need for for business um, and the need to protect certain public policies or, or certain interests and i think that sort of approach is reflected in some of the proposals that we've seen i'll just quickly touch upon uh things some of the issues that have been raised in the context of the gsi proposal uh based on publicly available information i mean i know there's three proposals textual proposals that the EU has made. Um, the one with most uh, provisions uh, dates back to the beginning of the first round of negotiations. And it includes several, uh, several issues that I, I may not be able to name all of them, but it covers issues on uh, spam, for instance, uh, privacy protection, uh, uh, privacy protection, um, yeah, private, data privacy and, and, sorry, data protection and privacy. Uh, it also covers um, the, the usual prohibitions on you know, uh, source code disclosures, data localization, the imposition of custom duties on um, electronic transmissions. Um, and there's also, I think, um, provisions on recognizing the validity of e-signatures and e-contracts, and that's more on the trade facilitation element. And from this proposals, I think there's two things that really stand out for me, which I think maybe may not be seen from what other member states have, uh, other members of the WTO have, have uh, proposed, which is uh, a revision of the telecommunications reference paper, at least they've proposed an update. Now the telecommunications reference paper, as most of us will know, is that it's, it's, it provides some sort of disciplines to put to uh, protect or rather to regulate competitive behaviors of um, suppliers in the telecom, uh, telecom industry. And the EU's proposal seeks to update that, uh, to sort of bring that in line with um, uh, the, the reality of the digital space that, that we're in and the relevance of telecom for that. Then there's also a proposal on market access commitments, uh, both in services and in goods. And for the goods one, I think one of the things that really stands out is that the EU has proposed to have uh, members of the JSI um, process, whatever outcome might be, to have the members join the, the ITA, um, the, the, the information technology uh, agreement. And I think that's some of the proposals that might be, you know, uh, that might stand out from what we already have uh, from other member states. Um, I think the other thing I would probably touch upon is in the course of this process, um, there's questions of transparency. We've discussed whether the, the consolidated text is um, the, the most updated version. I think from the EU side, the idea is that they're open to transparency, which is why most of their textual proposals are um, published. But I think we can agree that, that the issue of the discussions at the JSI level don't not, do not only fall on the EU, and that, that depends on what other member states um, also, um, also, also have to, to, to propose. Uh, I think one other thing that I would mention is essentially tied to the idea of this value-based approach is the EU is keen on uh, maintaining some form of policy space in uh, a number of issues, most of them um, AI, which is artificial intelligence, um, issues to deal with uh, privacy, as I mentioned, and data protection and, and data in, in general, or data sharing. So I think that's one of the areas where, you know, going into the negotiations, we might see um, some, some lack of convergence, um, or at least the EU probably not agreeing to proposal stable because it wants to maintain its policy space um, in, in these areas. I, I think I'll stop here and then uh, leave whatever else that needs to be 
uh, presented in the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Marianne, for such a comprehensive overview on the EU's role in negotiations. Um, now we've heard from um, our presenters about the big three, the US, EU, and China, but there are a lot of other countries that are involved in the negotiations, and there are a lot of other small WTO members, especially, uh, who are not involved in the plurilateral negotiations, uh, but who might um, obviously have uh, some interests uh, in the multilateral e-commerce negotiations that are also happening. Um, so Kim, can you tell us maybe a little bit about the role that small developing countries have both in the plurilateral, but also maybe in the multilateral negotiations at the WTO? Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, can you hear me okay? I hope so, <laughs> great. Thank you, Nicholas, and I'd also like to thank the Trade Policy Exchange for the invitation to contribute to this discussion this afternoon. I will, as Nicholas mentions, present the general interest and perspective of smaller economies with regard to these negotiations. And I'll also touch, touch briefly on what could constitute a potential development-friendly outcome. Just a small disclaimer, I'm speaking today in my personal capacity, and therefore I won't say anything here today in relation to the negotiations that is not in the, in the public domain. So who is the, a bit about the Commonwealth? We're a voluntary intergovernmental association of 54 countries. Uh, we comprise advanced and developing economies, 14 LDCs, 25 small island developing countries, and 32 small states, which are designated according to Com Commonwealth Secretariat criteria. We have our office in Geneva, where I work, uh, providing support, trade support, mainly in relation to WTO negotiating issues to the small states. So at the moment in the JSI, there are 86 members to date. Um, four, three small states from the Commonwealth have formally joined, but as Nicholas mentions, many more are monitoring and observing the negotiations. So some general considerations, um, we all know the opportunities of e-commerce, especially now after uh, in the midst of COVID, global rules that regulate the space can improve and expand fair and equitable access to e-commerce and market opportunities, and as well as remove trade barriers, including for the smallest operators and MSMEs in small economies, because it could enable them to participate in global supply chains and the digital market and e-commerce marketplace. Many small states in the Commonwealth are ge geographically remote, landlocked, distant from major markets with limited pr product and market diversification, limited economies of scale, facing acutely high trade costs. So they can potentially capitalize on these discussions and the e-commerce and digitalization to become cross-border sellers of goods and services online rather than just passive consumers. And obviously this would enhance uh, economic diversification, job creation and economic growth. So COVID as, as I mentioned has, has highlighted the vast potential of, of the digital solutions to bridge geographic distance, create new markets in the digital space. And subscribing to the JSI on e-commerce could be helpful for small economies, both to maintain conducive business environments because it would justify much needed upgrades to regulatory frameworks in the digital space, but also it would engender stable legal frameworks to, um, to attract investment, which is another thing that is critical in a post-COVID environment, as well as enabling learning, best, exchanging best practice from uh, more advanced trade partners. But as COVID has shown, the, the pandemic has highlighted the harsh reality of the digital barriers and constraints that many small states face. And these include hard and soft infrastructural challenges, including intermit, inter, intermittent access to affordable, reliable, high-speed internet connections, low levels of skill capacity, underdeveloped regulatory and legal frameworks and institutional mechanisms, and significant financing gaps as well as uh, severe customs and logistical constraints. So overall, small states lack mature digital ecosystems. Many saw lagging behind advanced economies, 
being technology importers and having low access to digital infrastructure. And just to cite some statistics, according to Commonwealth Secretariat Research, uh, low-income countries in the Commonwealth, uh, only amongst them, only 16% of the population are online, and only 6% are, have home internet access. Similarly, only 35% of Commonwealth small states have data protection laws actually in place, compared to an average of around 80% for high-income economies. And in case of LDCs, this is even lower, somewhere around 17%. So smaller economies face a disproportionately higher burden and cost as, and as well as resource burden in transitioning from analog to digital business models. Therefore, they would have to bring, do more to bring their e-commerce systems in line with future provisions, especially if these are modeled on what more advanced countries already have. So a little bit about a potential development enhancing agenda in this JSI which is recognized in both the MC11 and Davos ministerial mandates. It recognized the challenges developing and LDCs, LDC countries face, as well as the development of symmetries. And the proponents too recognize these challenges and are very encouraging for all members to join the, this initiative and articulate the challenges. At the same time, the JSR participants have reconfirmed their expectations for a higher ambition outcome amongst as many WTO members as possible, predicated on adding value to existing agreements. And this is in the, in the ministerial mandates as well. So for developing countries with nascent legal and regulatory frameworks, a recurring theme would be how to regulate or how to preserve regulatory autonomy or policy space, as has been mentioned, for laws and processes, processes that they've yet to develop. Um, so as these negotiations unfold, we're likely to see these uh, issues come, come more to the fore, especially as the tension between uh, what governments are allowed to regulate and the leeway provided to private operators as, as this becomes more evident. Um, and also, as the negotiations progress, the focus will have to be on how to enhance cross-border digital trade and e-commerce in a way that avoids unduly prescriptive and detailed e-commerce provisions, and at the same time allowing the many divergent practices in regulating e-commerce of the different members, including developing countries, to be recognized. So therefore, it's crucial that the, these negotiations meaningfully address a development outcome in some form, not only to take on and implement the ultimate commitments, but also to foster the development of national and regional uh, e-commerce ecosystems. Um, and due to the digital divide that, I, that I've described, these obligations would have to be balanced with commensurate levels of special differential treatment to induce more members to join or to find the, the prospect of joining this JSI attractive. The TFA, has, as Fabiana has mentioned, could present a useful model because it links acquisition, implementation of commitments to acquisition of capacity and allows countries to self-designate which commitments they can take on in which time frame and subject to certain uh, time-bound exemptions for being subject to dispute settlement and subject to appropriate technical assistance and capacity building. But the extent to which this TFA model is fit for purpose in delivering a meaningful development outcome will no doubt be interrogated by the negotiating parties as the negotiations unfold. Of course, the, from a process perspective, the negotiations would also need to be open, transparent, and inclusive with reasonable deadlines and processes to enable developing countries and the smaller ones especially to actually participate. And also you cannot de-link the negotiating environment from the treatment of development in current uh, rhetoric in the WTO and overall questions around WTO reform, which is also likely to delink to dictate the ultimate course going forward, as well as the overall geopolitical trade landscape. And as uh, Susanna mentioned, a lot of these issues are targeted at curb are targeted to curb digital protectionism and lay down fair rules of play for the key protagonists, the largest being China and the US. 
So therefore, we'll also have to see as the negotiations unfold, the extent to which these negotiations can accommodate the interests of smaller developing countries in that equation and allow them to shape rules at their own pace in order to be more pal palatable to a broader uh, membership. So uh, I'll stop there. I'm happy to take questions, thanks. Thank you so much, Kim, for bringing in the perspective of uh, developing countries. And we now have 20 minutes for um, a discussion with our audience. Um, and I would kindly ask you to use the Q&A function um, and not the chat to ask your questions. Um, and even if you don't ask a question, you can engage in this process interactively by um, upvoting the questions that interest you. So um, in case we run out of time, that will um, allow us to see which questions have the greatest interest to the greatest number of people in the audience. So um, I thank you very much for that. And to start off the discussion, um, I um, want to uh, push you a little bit on your perspective um, of how you likely you think there is going to be an outcome before MC12 in November. Um, we have seen some progress recently in, um, in relatively minor areas of the negotiations, like e-signatures and spam and consumer protection, of course, all important, but the big ticket items um, like data flow and data localization um, have not really made a lot of progress. So my question to Susan and Fabiana would be, Susan, would the US agree to anything um, that doesn't include data flows or a significant commitment on data flows? And Fabiana, the reverse, would China be willing to agree to including data flows in this agreement beyond those minimal commitments that you alluded to in your presentation? So I'm kicking off the discussion with this. Um, after this question, um, I will go into the Q&A. And um, again, I li I'd like to ask the audience to ask their questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box. Um, and even the audience members that uh, don't ask questions can upvote the questions that are of interest to them. So Susan and Fabiana, data flows. I, I guess I don't really understand and this question because I think from day one this has been about data flows and when I say day one I, I mean 1998. I mean the internet and e are built on cross-border data flow. So I, I, you know I cannot speak for the U.S. except it without the default. That is what we are talking about. That Now that said and China has accepted that to some extent in RCEP. Fabiana? Um, yeah, um, I guess, I guess uh, to some extent, yes. I think that it is impossible for China or any other emerging economies to avoid negotiating this topic. Uh, but at the same time, as I've mentioned, I think that security considerations um, is the top priority for China. And the difference and disagreement uh, I understand is uh, lies lying uh, in the definition and consideration of various security interests and risks that might come along, uh, which includes like data security, internet security, and national security. So um, my opinion is I think the key is to have a reasonable limit on the definition of essential security interest or security exceptions that can strike the balance between uh, legitimate uh, public policy objectives and possible protectionist measures, as um, Kim has mentioned. So, yeah, I, I hope this answers your question. Thank you very much, Fabiana. So I will now uh, start and um, to ask you the questions that are coming in from the audience. And first, we have a question from Richard Hill. Richard asks, why should telecommunications issues be discussed in the WTO instead of the ITU? 
which is the specialized body for telecommunications. Who would like to take that question? Um, I'm happy to start off uh, noting that I, I pro probably uh, brought this on to myself uh, with my discussion on what the EU does. I think the idea of having telecommunication services, uh, um, at least the, the regulatory framework discussed uh, within this WTO context is essentially because the services are a key enabler of e-commerce. It's important that we have um, the regulatory rules applying to this sector um, supporting uh, e-commerce and encouraging online activity uh, for businesses and, and for consumers. Um, there's already some regulatory framework on telecommunication services within the GATS framework, and that's the, the telecommunication reference paper that I mentioned. And it sort of sets out a number of you know, regulatory principles that are geared towards ensuring um, competitiveness within the service. And I think that in the end, I mean, ultimately, the idea is to expand um, the, the internet or the availability of the internet uh, to more businesses and, and to consumers. So that there's definitely a need to have these discussions within um, the WTO. Now, why this might possibly come up within the JSI context is perhaps to do with the fact that the reference paper was uh, discussed at a time when you know the innovations that we currently have had it could not possibly be, be imagined. Well, could be imagined, but had not really um, taken shape. So I think it's it's in this context that perhaps the EU sees the relevance of uh, updating um, and extending uh, the reference paper to capture the, the current reality of, of where we are. Okay, thank you very much. I think that answers um, the question pretty well. Um, the next question we have here is by Tabiwa Cheyuka. Um, the question is, um, I think, probably best for Kim. Um, the Africa continental free trade area recently came into operation. How can Africa leverage this agreement, considering they're soon to negotiate an e-commerce protocol vis-a-vis -vis negotiations at the WTO? Should Africa delay its participation in the negotiations until it has its laws in place? Kim, do you think you can take this one? Sure, thanks, Nicholas. And thank you for that question. It's an e excellent question. Um, well, the, the African continental free trade area is obviously also going to be a game changer, in, not only in terms of uh, current uh, uh, market access uh, commitments, but future rules that may be developed. Um, so I think, you know, my comments that I made before in relation to uh, developing countries and the fact that they, by and large, um, are lagging behind more advanced economies in terms of level of development of the e-commerce ecosystem. Although in Africa, there are many countries that are starting to forge ahead and, and become more innovative and, and developing their own uh, e-commerce marketplaces as well. But I think as for, for most developing economies, I think what would need to happen similar to the TFA is there needs to be a process of needs assessment, uh, gap analysis to, to kind of make a, a, a cost benefit weighing up of what commitments they would uh, would able, ultimately be able to take on and, and now and what commitments should wait. Um, so, in terms of how Africa could leverage this, uh, the, the, the regional agreement, I think it would be important to sort of up, keep updated with what's going on in the WTO negotiations, because not forgetting there's also the 1998 multilateral work program, which is a, a non-negotiating agenda to explore um, the trade related issues that arise. Um, and I think uh, it would be wise to perhaps use the, the JSI negotiations to take specific issues, thematic issues out of that and explore them in the context of the work program to inform the African continental free trade agreement and whatever um, rules and, and disciplines uh, that, that might want to be later crafted. So I think whatever the negotiate the position is with regard to negotiations, I think they should use the, the WTO process as a learning experience to 
learn from experience sharing of others, how trade provisions in relation to e-commerce are crafted, and what, what are the potential offensive interests of Africa in these negotiations. And uh, uh, that could definitely inform not only the ultimate uh, negotiating process for these provisions in, in the African context, but also the development of regional e-commerce digitalization strategies. So I hope that answers the question. Great, thanks, Kim. Next, we have a question for Susan. Okay, um, I, I <laughs> thank you for the question. Um, I disagree with the premise. I think, uh, while well, not admitting it, <clears throat> just like the World Bank, um, these issues are not just about human rights issues. They're about market access as well. And uh, the United States, as example right now, is examining whether censorship is a trade barrier. And I can't say what the US International Trade Commission will find, but my, I do believe, um, um, and I can share with you a paper I wrote on this, if it's of interest, that um, censorship and internet shutdowns are examples of barriers to trade. Now, how far do you take it? Is an intranet a barrier to trade? Um, you know, an entire nation's intranet? Um, you know, it, especially if a nation says this is to uh, protect social stability. So I think what I'm really trying to say here, Mariella, is we need to think about these things and examine the trade distorting aspects of them. And we probably need to limit the exceptions to some extent. Now, this is not new. Uh, this started in 1948 when the United States objected and other European countries said, you know, you're going to have to be flexible. When Czechoslovakia had a coup, you know, the GATT was supposed to be a club of democracies. Democracy and trade were supposed to be related. Um, and, you know, after the coup, the United States said, let's kick out Czechoslovakia. And the other nations said, no, let's not do that. There's been a long history of various human rights and trends, Cambridge published in 2007. So that's not to say that it's explicit, it's often implicit. And the effects of trade on human rights and the regulation of trade and human rights can be indirect, right? So a spillover effect of WTO membership, uh, its transparency requirements have been for Saudi Arabia to post its regulations in various languages. And that allows non-citizens and citizens alike to comment. We've seen this in China as well on the regulatory process. So I, I'm, I, I tend to be Pollyannish about it. Um, and, and I'd love to talk with you further about it, but I don't see this. I mean, one way to frame it is yes, these are human rights issues. Yes, they are political, but the WTO has dealt with that throughout its history. Sometimes it's danced away from it, but not always. And I think that's why I'm, I'm trying to introduce the privacy labels thing, um, because that is an example of a social label in a sense, starting to seep in. Hello, can you hear me? I'm afraid my computer just crashed and I disappeared. Oh, no. And my computer is still restarting. So I am, um, I am back here, but I can't see the Q&A. So if maybe one of the panelists okay. could look into the Q&A box and take the, okay. Um, okay. the question with the highest number of votes. Thank you. I will try to get my computer up again in a second. Here's a question for Kim. Um, you mentioned SDT provisions on e-commerce, but wouldn't China, a large developing high-tech country, still fall under SDT? 
Tim? Thanks very much for the question. I can't see uh, the name of the delegate, but thank you. Um, I think uh, the question of SNDT is a larger conceptual issue around development in the WTO. Yes, China would fall under SNDT, um, as would other countries that self-designate themselves as developing. Um, at the moment, there's no, as I understand, um, intention to differentiate amongst developing countries. So um, obviously China is, uh, as I mentioned, is one of the, the giants in, in the, the key players in this area. But I don't think, I think China uh, negotiates, as Fabio mentioned, on, on the basis of, of its own interests and on the basis of uh, um, where it, it feels the ultimate WTO rules will align with its um, competitive interests, but also very much supports developing country positions. Um, so it tracks, I think it tries to achieve a balance on that. Um, so how the rules ultimately play out, I think will, will kind of uh, sort of organize themselves around who the biggest players are uh, in, the, in the game rather than, than labels. But of course, it's very important to maintain the integrity of the mandates and the commitment to ensuring a development outcome for those developing countries that aren't as big as China and who are, are really late in the game and still catching up. Marianne, just to add to that, what about okay, industry thank you. protection for data? Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, Susan, could, could you please say that again? Um, I've heard a lot of developing countries say they want, like Egypt and Pakistan have said they want infant industry protection for their data. Uh, I'm not sure I, I fully understand uh, the question, uh, the question was, perhaps you could uh, repeat that for me. Uh, well, let's let's let Nick take charge if you are ready, Nick. Nick, are you ready? <laughs> yes. Sorry, I, I I deeply apologize that this happened here. Um, so I uh, think we have time for one more question from the Q and A, and then uh, we're reaching the end of this uh, this webinar. Um, so there is um, a an anonymous question. Um, and uh, maybe whoever uh, thinks is best suited for this can answer it. Um, can the panelists please discuss the paper circulated by India and South Africa opposing plurilateral agreements, not just the JSI on digital, but also the JSIs on domestic regulation investment for development MSMEs. Uh, why are India and South Africa doing this? Um, Fabiana or Susan, do you have an answer to this? Um, let me try to answer it briefly and maybe Susan can add to that. So I think um, um, his, uh, South Africa and India is trying to focus on the traditional issue of the Doha around such as fisheries. And, they, and the point of view is that if we start to negotiate new rules uh, before um, concluding the existing uh, trade topics, it might dilute the, the negotiations uh, tension for it. For them. And also, um, it is arguable that whether or not the WTM mandate support the negotiation of plurilateral agreement. Uh, but I would like to, um, but I would like to say that actually, uh, it is also arguable that the variable ge geomet geometry has been existing in the, in the WTO, but just in different format. So um, I guess, uh, we are still expecting to reach a common ground to get um, these two important emerging economies on board. Uh, but definitely we have to find the right balance in how to allocating 
uh, negotiating with negotiation resources among all these important um, topics. And and I also think that yeah, join, um, joining the e-commerce GSI is, is also of interest um, to uh, India and South Africa, but just um, maybe, yeah, it is a, is the matter of finding the right balance and timing, perhaps. And okay, thanks Fabiana for answering such a difficult question. And um, we have reached the end of this webinar. I would like to thank all of our attendees and especially the panelists again for such a very stimulating discussion. I'm sure we will hear a lot about uh, the e-commerce plurilateral in the coming months. And uh, it remains exciting and to be seen what will happen um, at um, the next ministerial conference of the WTO. Um, for now, I invite you to uh, follow the Trade Policy Exchange on Twitter and LinkedIn um, at Trade Policy X and uh, join us for our uh, upcoming webinars, most notably on June 16th on the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement in the Asia Pacific. And I look forward to seeing all of you again in the near future. Thank you again and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.